In today's episode, Chloe and I talk with Dr. Bronnie Lennox-Thompson. Bronnie is an incredible practitioner and researcher in the area of the psychosocial aspects of long-term pain. And uh, this is really a a fascinating in-depth conversation where I'm sure you'll have many brain-exploding emojis. Um, Chloe and I both did, and I know you're going to enjoy our chat with Bronnie Lennox-Thompson. Hey, Chloe. Hey, Raph. <laughs> hey, Bronnie. Hi, how are you? Now I can hear awesome. you. Awesome, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> well, I've been really excited about this, uh, Bronnie. So uh, we've got a fantastic uh, guest on today, uh, Bronnie Lennox-Thompson. And uh, Bronnie, you know I'm one of your your biggest fans. I think I've <laughs> I feel like I've kind of fanned girled you for the last uh, since I came across you. I'm not sure how many a while ago. Now. Yeah, yeah. I think I. Uh, Oh gosh, how would have I first come across you? I'm sure in some of the the realm with all the, the the crew that were discussing pain. So probably somewhere along the lines of Ben Cormack and Adam Meekins, et cetera. And right. then that fantastic um, ex- exploring pain. What What is the page called now? Exploring pain, research and meaning. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from that page and, yeah. and your input on that page. And yeah, I'm just, as I said, I'm one of your biggest fans. Basically, I was saying to Raf, and uh, this will be great for, our, you know, our listeners are like, well, how, you know, how did you find out about Bronnie? And it's basically uh, any time, Bronnie, that I see you've either posted something or commented on something, <laughs> you've instantly got my attention because you've just I mean it's not just that I think I, I gravitate towards you as well because you're uh, a, a woman in the industry and it seems like there's a lot of male figures in the industry as a as a female looking in yeah. um, but because you, not just that but it's just how you gosh not only hold your own but you shine this light and Uh, You come in and you're just this, oh, my gosh, you've always got compassion. So I notice the compassion in the way that you communicate. Uh, Your critical thinking is just, you know, off the charts. Um, (laughs) And you've just got this way of explaining things so that you, you captivate me and then you get me thinking about things differently to how I was thinking about things potentially. And, yeah, I've learnt... I've learned and continue to learn so much from you. Like you are truly someone in the industry that I just um, got red lipstick on my hand. Sorry. <laughs> just look down like, why have I got red right in the center of my palm? That's really unusual. Um, but yeah, you're truly someone that I just, I, I you know, I just so look up to um, and yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you on the podcast. Like thrilled, 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 thrilled. thrilled. So, yes. sorry for totally, so uh, totally that overtaking that, that rap, but I'm just like, <laughs> it's Bronnie. I'm going to have my fangirl moment. <laughs> so that's why, that's why I love you, Bronnie. And you've always been what I love too. <laughs> I haven't finished. <laughs> I'll get it all out of my system. <laughs> uh, I love that you're so approachable. You know, I have, I've DM'd you with questions um, and we're going to talk about you as an occupational therapist and what that means. And when mm-hmm. I was sort of exploring, would I go down the route of studying um, OT, I, I DM'd you and I said, can I get some advice? And you just, you're there and you're like, sure, let's have a chat. And yeah, so I really appreciate you and your time. So, Thank yeah. you. It's, it's part of, um, for me, knowledge translation. So we've got a whole lot of stuff that's locked up inside journals or at universities or in libraries and people on the ground just can't get to it. And to be able to read it, which I love doing, and then to be able to put it into practical terms so we know what to do with it is a really, it's like a missing link in so much of our, I don't know, education. Like, you know, people get, You might get three years of university training on something and then you go out into the wide world and promptly forget it all and you get these half thoughts through things. 
And so, and you spend much more time out there in the world doing life than you do at an institution. And we put all of this time into what we teach people at school and then forget the rest of it. So I tried to, when I started blogging, which was in 2007, um, that was part of my purpose was to say, well, I know a bit of stuff. I've been doing this a wee while. Can't I get it out there so that people can um, don't have to go to a university course to learn it? Because yeah. not everybody has the time or the money to go do that. Well, yeah. and so yeah. many of our so many of our listeners, and I know this because they they DM me and say, you know. How do you keep up to date with things? What do you do? Well, you know, I, I look to people like you. I look to people like Ben. I look to people like Adam. I look to people like Lars, uh, et cetera, because that's at Greg Lehman and so on, because you are, you are doing exactly what you just said. You're grabbing the research paper. You're reading it through and then you are disseminating it in and putting it out there in a way that me, the lay person, can understand it. Uh, and and get intrigued by it, and then you know think about how can I apply that in in the work that I do and in the education that I do. So, oh, cool. big props. Mission <laughs> accomplished. Yay! I can yeah. leave now. I can retire. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you get a word. I'll let. I'll let you get a word in now, Raf. <laughs> hey, fun fact, yeah. uh, which I just recently learned, is that. Um, you know, if you're in Australia, which Chloe and I are, you know, there's a steady trickle of jokes about New Zealand accents. Um, uh, but if you're in America, apparently... We sound the same. Australians, New Zealanders and British all sound the same and you can't tell them apart. But like Canadian and the US. Yeah. Well, parts of the US. Parts of Canada. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we have a different accent. I have to remind everybody that I meet that I, we have a different accent. We are not the same country, although you are the West Island, which is fine <laughs> to me. And we've got less COVID, but that's, we won't even go into that because that's just sucks. But, you know, we have... Um, Coming we to have you got, from lockdown um, here, Bronnie. Yeah, no, <laughs> we're in freedom place. And my niece is with me at the moment. She she's come from England. She's been with us since um February. And just not having to wear a mask to go into a supermarket. Oh was gosh, like I can imagine. Off. And you know, we we've been doing that for ages. We have Lord doing live concerts with a huge number of people, actually physical people. Touching uh, each other and cool. yeah. dancing and <laughs> oh my gosh, how much yeah. I miss that. Yeah. Oh. So we, we're pretty happy, Rass but like, we are oh. very different. <laughs> not, not your thing, Ray. I'm living my best life in lockdown here, but i i don't want to i don't want to um, i don't want to uh, prevent anybody else from living their best life at a at a concert. Well, I'm actually really happy under lockdown because I live behind. The reason I'm always on social media and stuff is because I have no life. I just no, that's not quite true, but I tend to spend a lot of time. And I dip in and out and I learn a heap of stuff. Mm. And what I what I learn from that is what I can then bring into my university teaching. Because if there are misconceptions or questions or weird ways that people are applying stuff, then I learn about that through this discussion with people, everyday people. Mm. And then I can put that into how I try and bring across this um, convey the information that we, we do at the university level. Because that's part of our job, I mm. think. If we don't get people excited about learning this stuff, then what's the point of doing all that research? Oh, my so goodness. Think- that's so true. So what do you – Bronnie, can you – I mean, Raf and I, I know what you do, um, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you also make really beautiful jewellery, just side note. Um, <laughs> Bronnie's got some wicked skills. Uh, but could you let our listeners who may not um, know know what you do, can you give a little bit of a sort of bio, what you've been doing for the last however many years, what you're currently doing? <laughs> yeah, um, so I graduated as an occupational therapist way, way back in 1984. So I'm an old hand. Um, and I've worked in pain management pretty much my entire career from 
I had a few years out when I was a trolley dolly, so I worked for Air New Zealand as a did as you? Yes, 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 I did. I did not know that. Yeah, coffee, tea, or me, um, <laughs> and sweet <laughs> sweeties, darling. <laughs> um, and then I came back and I started to do some work in pain management because I was doing vocational rehab as an occupational therapist and seeing that most of the people that I was seeing had pain as their problem. And I thought, well, I know a little bit about pain. I'm going to learn some more so I can help these guys. So I started to get interested in pain. This was, I had pain at the time, but I didn't have a label for it. Mm. So after a while, I moved um, to Christchurch and started to do my master's in psychology. So I have a master's um, in psychology where I kind of got the language and the understanding of research because that was Oh, it was there in my OT training, but it wasn't substantial enough for me to know what to do with it. And I'm really interested in psychosocial factors that are involved in pain because they are the most influential factors for ongoing disability. And so we tend to think about pain as you've either got it or you haven't. And if you've got it, then you're going to be disabled by it inevitably. That's not true. Um, and not a lot of people are aware of that really complicated relationship between pain intensity, disability, and also what's going on in the tissues. Mm. So I got really interested in trying to understand more of the psychological aspects, although I'm finding myself now going much more into the social aspects because they're probably even more influential it's just they're messier and much more difficult to understand and, and to research. So I did my master's. Wow. Did my um, master's thesis was looking at return to work for people who had graduated from pain management um, from a program, but they were still struggling to find work. And part of the, the struggle was I know all this stuff in theory and I can do it at home, but when you put me in my workplace, I cannot do my relaxation I can't pace myself because I work on a um, maybe a production line where the stuff is just coming along on a conveyor belt and I can't stop or I'm at the bottom of the picking order in the work hierarchy so I can't say I want to do it this way so I kind of wanted to understand those social elements that make it difficult for people to go back to work so I looked at in this study, we, we looked at people who graduated, we followed them up for, um, it was about three years of total overall um, follow-up, and we looked at what predicted their ability to return to work, and it isn't pain intensity, um, it isn't even the coping strategies, it was, for that group anyway, was knowing that they had some skills that they could still do, so knowing what they could still do and count on doing, um, that they knew how to find a job. So most people think, well, I'll go and see somebody who finds me a job. Mm. Then go back and think back to the last job that you found and think about how you found it. And I would lay good money on it that for the majority of people, it was somebody that tapped them on the shoulder or somebody that knew somebody yep. who said, I've got a job going. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. That's how people find work. And what I was finding was that a lot of our vocational services are based on the idea that you write a CV and then you distribute it wildly, hoping that one of them is going to come back with an answer. Whereas it looks like the most um, useful way is to say, I've got these really good skills. I'm going to understand this business and I'm going to find out where I flourish as a worker. And then I'm going to find places where I can do that kind of work with the right kind of people. And I'm going to knock on doors and I'm going to talk to people who can hire me. Now, that for someone with pain is really hard mm -hmm. because if you think about pain and disability, people, first of all, get pain and they say, oh, it's not going away. And then they say, hmm, I'm going to have to stop doing stuff. So the first thing they stop doing is fun stuff, mm. lose enjoyment leisure activities then they stop work and then the last thing they they give up is daily self-care showering and dressing and stuff like that so fun and work just disappear and they lose confidence people lose confidence to actually put themselves out there because there's no fun in the world and they don't think they can do what they used to be able to do and 
lots of people find their identity through what they do. Mm. You, what's the second question somebody asked mm. you? Oh, after what do you do? Name, what do you what do? You and if you can't say what you do, then you feel like absolute shit. So mm. that's what we found in this program is that we helped people develop those skills that they, and they had somebody that was backing them, they could actually go out and find work. Mm. It's hard. Nobody says it's easy. But it's certainly not about putting your CV out willy-nilly, hoping that somebody is going to say, oh, yes, I like you. Because mm. the truth is employers don't hire strangers. They hire people that are a bit like them, mm. and then they work with them until they've got the skills. Wow, sounds so. <laughs> um, that's Raf. That's very similar to in, when when we're talking to our our students who are just about to graduate. Uh, mm. We we basically have a lecture on well, how how do you find work now? And mm. it's that yep. go to the studios that you want to you know you want to work at. Get to know them. Get to it's it's not the don't send the cold call email or the or the CV. It's yep. that's not what they're going to look at. Yep. Create a create a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to unpack if I could um, just the the concept uh, of psychosocial factors and mm -hmm. chronic pain and how they are the biggest determinants now of you know and drivers or correlates at least of chronicity and so you know walk us through you know somebody has some kind of maybe acute pain situation maybe it's an injury maybe it's maybe it's not an injury it's just a like some kind of acute pain situation yep. you know for most people you know most of the time that settles within a couple of months and they get back to life as it was before but for some, <laughs> right, but for some people you know possibly around a third of people from the yep. literature I've read, it doesn't settle. Yep. You know, it might subside a bit, but then it comes back or it's, you know, fluctuates up and down over time and they develop this long-term problem called chronic pain or persistent pain. And so the things that drive that state tend to be not necessarily tissue related. So it's nothing we can pick up on an MRI scan or a CT mm -hmm. or it's not a disc bulge or a muscle strain or a whatever. Mm -hmm. But it, we tend to find that these people have particular... Um, you know, profiles around these things called psychosocial factors. So can you talk us through yeah. what that means and, and why it's important? So let's break it down. So psychosocial simply means things that are psychological, your beliefs, your emotions, your attitudes, your memories, what you've learned in the past and what you predict might happen. That's all that kind of stuff. And then you've got, and that comes from your personal experience from what you learn through when you're growing up and, and, you know, inside your family and what kind of attitudes are reinforced by your family. So, you know, you, you, you have our, we have our high country sheep farmers who are stoic blokes, mate, and they don't give in to their pain. So they just soldier on um, and they kind of present as this really, stoic people they learn it as they're growing up while they're living on a high country sheep station um and so when they have an injury instead of stopping and recovering these guys will often push through they will continue they'll push and push and push until they find that either they recover which is really cool or they don't and if they don't then they're often quite um they feel really vulnerable at that point because this is their livelihood so that's the psychological part. The social part is about that family and what they um, the re they respond to, the person's partner, their kids, what our communities tell us, even what's um, available under our legislation. So depending on how the legislation is written, some people get some excellent compensation. Others will have the same pain problem, but they don't fit those criteria, so they don't. Uh, and that means they have totally different ways of viewing their pain. So in, in New Zealand, we've got accident compensation corporation. Um, so somebody who develops back pain, if if they believe that they have injured their back, then they see it as an injury. And when we think about an injury, we think about acute tissue damage. We think there's probably some swelling, there's probably a bit of redness, it's going to be painful. Um, it, there might be a bit of blood if you're lucky and a bit of bruising, but it will settle down um, unless it doesn't heal. And so people who talk about a back injury, 
start continue often thinking about their back problem as being it hasn't healed yet. And that can be reinforced by us as you know treatment people where we talk about protecting that part of the body because it hasn't healed yet. Um, or we might think about ways that we can modify stuff so this person doesn't have to do things that push into that zone. And that that social element adds that other bit into why some people's pain persists. But I also want to pull tease these words apart. So pain's the experience, right? Pain's what we feel, um, and it's negative. Everybody, I don't know anybody who loves their pain, and if they do, come come have a chat because we'll sort that one out. Um, <laughs> even people who have fetishes, and I study people who do um, body suspension. So these are guys and women who use humongous great hooks through their flesh. And then they raise themselves up off the surface of the ground, yeah. suspended completely through these hooks. Now, they, they do this deliberately and purposefully. They want to experience the pain. Well, they don't really want to experience the pain. They want to experience being suspended. But you've got to have the pain to get there. And they say, one, one participant said to me, it hurts like a bitch. <laughs> well, it does. It hurts like a bitch. Well, it's a very thick needle. It's probably about, uh, it's a six gauge needle, which is probably about six mil. Oof. It's big, a big needle. Yeah. It's what not. body points are they going through? Depends on the person, but often it will be shoulders, middle of the back, oh. um, hips, back of the legs. Yeah. It's quite, um, quite phenomenal. Oh. And I'm just thinking right yeah. now, Bronnie, about the paper you shared today about expectation of level of pain. My <laughs> expectation is that that level of pain would be humongous. I'm never going there. <laughs> and they, that's what these guys say. They expect that it's going to hurt. Right. But I want you to think, so we, we kind of have a judgment about these, but they're a bit odd, right? But I'd like to just call your attention to people who do weightlifting. People who <laughs> go to the gym. People who run long distances, it is not pain free. Yeah, right. It hurts. Uh, the, I'm a it, it, it hurts. Yeah, you know every what? marathon runner I've ever talked to, they talk about <laughs> the, the excruciating sort of. But they, pain. Everybody, I mean, I think we can all think of examples where we do stuff that hurts because we want something out of it. Mm. If you're a runner and you do a, a long distance thing, you do it for the runner's high at the end of it, mm. or to tick it off and say, Yay, I did this. Mm. Or you can say, I'm never doing that again. Or you do it because somebody else said, Well, I'll do it with you. So there's lots of reasons that we do difficult stuff, painful stuff, um, in the pursuit of something else. Right. So we just bracket that. So pain's the experience. Uh-huh. And it's made up of stuff that goes on in the tissues neurological stuff and I don't want to get into any more detail than that but it's also made up of the impact of how we think about stuff what we think think and expect is going on how we remember um the last time we did this so think about kids getting their very first jab not the six-week jab but the maybe the five-year-old jabs Mm. the first time they don't remember what it was like to have a jab so they're not really very phased and then you take them back for the second lot right? <laughs> and they do not like it they learn and it's not that the pain's any different yeah another really good example of that sort of interpretation and how that affects our experience is so you're thinking of going for a walk illegally for you guys under lockdown <laughs> um, in a dark alley and somebody in that dark alley approaches you with a syringe and you don't know what's in it it could be a dirty one, and they hit you with it, and you get your your flesh pierced by this thing. What do you do? What's going through your mind? I would be freaking the fuck out. Here's what would be going on through mm, my mind. Like, you'd be going <laughs> right away to ED, and you'd be saying, help me, yeah. I've got something nasty going on, right? Yeah. And then think about the, the amount of tissue um, damage yeah. going on at the time, and your COVID jabs. I haven't had mine yet, um, but when you have a COVID jab, we do your blood test. We do those willingly, and we do not rush off to ED. Yeah, 
And the point of that is, is that our experience of pain is that emotional thing mm. as well as the sensory thing. Mm. And it's only associated with tissue damage or it feels like it should be mm. associated with tissue damage. So we learn about pain from the time we're born. Mm. Newborn baby gets its heel jabbed to get the gustory test, to get the blood test out. They'll do blood typing and they'll test for um, vitamin K and make sure that you're not um, thinner, phenol pet in Europe. And that baby will cry. And that's your first experience of pain. Wow. And then we learn how we ought to respond to pain thereafter based on what it feels like to us, but also other, what other people say yeah. and how they react to it. And so that's the difference between the experience of pain and then the what we do about it, which we can call pain behavior. Right. So things that people do. And also, sorry, sorry, not sorry. just. Can a, I just, can I just yeah. ask uh, to untease this a little bit? <laughs> because I think this notion of, you know, our thoughts and our social contexts our expectations, you know, affecting or even possibly driving this experience or our response to the experience of pain is a, is, can be quite a nuanced concept Mm -hmm. and what can easily people, I think can easily make the mistake of thinking like it's psychological means quote, it's all in your head. You're imagining it, you're making it up. And that leads to, and I know this is work that you've done as well, Bronnie, about the stigmatization of particularly of women yeah. who yeah. have pain as like, oh, it's kind of hysterical, quote. Um <laughs> Yeah. So can you can you can you kind of untease that and and can we decouple the idea of it's all in your head yeah. from it psychosocial? So psychosocial refers to the factors that influence the experience, but we don't have pain, acute pain, so short-term pain that's just come on. We don't have pain that occurs without some kind of, I'll call it nociceptive input, and I'll unpack that. So we can't create pain with just by telling somebody, you're going to feel pain. Right. What we can do is if they've got some kind of stimulation going on. So somebody's poking them with something. That's nociception. Nociception is activity in those high threshold nerves that send information about potential threat to your body into the spinal cord and then they wend their way on up to the brain. And they're also influenced by stuff from the brain coming down to kind of change how much information gets there. Now, if we think about... um, nociception that's occurring all the time and if you've been sitting while we've been talking your butt is probably getting numb by now I've just noticed my foot actually <laughs> now that you bring my attention to it I was like oh my heel feels a bit uncomfortable which is weird <laughs> if you're sitting for any period of time your mechanoreceptors are these these are nociceptors so they're um, specialized nerve endings that respond to mechanical pressure that is potentially going to harm you. And so unless you move, and we move without even knowing we've moved, you've shifted in your chair about a thousand times. I know I have. I do it all the time. We do that without noticing. And that's our body's really cool way of saying, I want to manage this input without you knowing about it, which is awesome. And then we have the experience. So here's a way to, to test it out. I'd like you just to not blink. Just don't blink for a while. How long can you do that for? And what do you want to do? What do you know? Ralph's winning this competition. I blinked within two seconds. I'm a I'm a excessive blinker though. I um I've got a a teenage daughter now. She's a little bit past this, but only a year or two ago, she would challenge me to and and my wife to a a see who blinks first contest. So I've got some practice at this, Chloe. Yeah, I just felt like you really you really nailed that, Raf. I, I blinked in two seconds. <laughs> so the thing about that is that we, the reason that we blink is because we have got this dry eye thing. And that is in response to, this is, this is nociceptive input ah. that is signaling to us, if you don't blink, you're going to get, your eye is going to dry out and then you're not going to, you're going to end up with um, ulcerated eyes. 
We don't want that. No. So I'm going to make it uncomfortable for you not to blink, right? And as soon as I draw your attention to it, I <laughs> betcha you're noticing how often you blink. I'm blinking so much now, Bronnie. Yep. <laughs> But this, My is a eyes really, to water. this is a really good example of how saying something isn't giving you a sore eye. It is just bringing your attention yeah. to what's going on. And attention is a psychological thing. So as soon as I draw your attention to the fact that you've moved a lot or that you're blinking, you'll notice it, right? So, Bronnie, with the, I, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on um, – particularly times that I've got my blood taken and, you know, I'm not a huge needle fan. I'm not like a total like, eh, it's a needle, but I don't, I don't, I don't like to see it. Right. I don't want to see it. And, and when I go in, I say to them, I don't want to see it. And I also say, let's have a chat. Like I love to talk, love it when they, you know, and they're really, um, Raph's like, do you? And they're really, um, <laughs> Raph, I can see your face. Uh, got competition here. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about that's just, it's a great tactic for distraction, distracting yourself. Yeah. Right? Which changing, move, moving your attentional focus to a different place. So you're not focusing yeah. on the, on the so necessity exactly of Exactly there. Yeah. It is a psychological thing. It's like, you know, all this stuff is going on in your body. Yeah. Show the torch on the bits that are really important right now. What about what though, Bronnie, I was just going to ask, like, what about, I was just thinking the next nuance of that. The almost without fail, every one of those um, pathologists, however, has all uh, pathologists, yeah, have um, what was it? What'd you say? Phlebotomists that take your blood. Phleb, say it again. Phlebotomists. Phlebotomists. Yeah. Phlebo- I've never heard that in my life. There you go. I've learned something. So, what they do though, and I don't know whether this helps or not. They all go, they, so I don't know what's going on. We're having a great old chat. You know, I'm not looking. Uh, they've cleaned my skin, you know, swabbed it. And then they go, little scratch, yeah. little scratch. And all of a sudden I feel the needle. Yeah. Do you, like, should they, don't you think they'd be better off just like just shoving it in? There's evidence both ways. Okay. <laughs> um, the idea of rubbing, though, is a good one, and I would, um, suggest anybody who's taking blood should really give it a good give your that area a really good rub, wrist rub because right. what you're doing then is activating one another set of fibres so it's like a gate control theory where we've got these quick fibres that send information really fast about this input and we've got slower fibres and they require, they transmit more slowly and they transmit more about pressure Right. So when we've got this nociceptive input, what we want to do is have that slower fibre responding to the pressure rather than the sharp ones responding to the ouchy bits. Oh. And there's only, there's only uh, both of those sets of fibres, the slow ones that respond to pressure and the, the more high-speed ones that respond to that more nociceptive input, they basically uh, – there are two railway tracks that converge into one crossing and so there's only one of those railway tracks, you know, the, the gates have to be closed on yep. one or other of those tracks and so you you can feel a deep, dull pressure and you can feel a sharp, stabbing pain in the same body part but not at the same time. Wow. And so if you if you have a sharp, stabbing pain and then you, you know, instinctively what we do is we kind of, you know, we, we apply pressure to that area, we squeeze it, we massage it, we wrap it in things, you know, and that basically, you know, turns the gate so that it, it opens the, the pressure nerves and, and closes the gate on the sharp stabbing yeah. nerves. So it allows that information through. That's why when you crack your shin on something, you swear first and then you rub furiously <laughs> because it helps. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. So, so in answer to your question, so we've yeah. got this pain experience yeah. and we've got what we do about it and then we've got what it feels like. Mm. So the pain is Pain experience is the is that what it feels like. That's the, the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that we know of as pain and we learn about and we we can't share. Mm-hmm. So you don't know whether I'm sore right now. Yeah. And even if you did think I was sore, you don't know what it actually feels like to me. Yeah. So the analogy is what a what is it, what does vanilla ice cream taste like? Am I tasting it the same way that you taste it? I don't know. Yeah. Might have the same stuff, but are we? And we had a conversation about coriander last night. 
Hey, Curry. <laughs> it's Coriander. so d- so divisive, isn't it? Hate it. And two in our family hate it because it tastes like soap. And I love it. And so we've got the same input and totally different experiences of it. It's the experience part that is of the taste that is equivalent to the pain part of what pain is to the sensory experience. So we might have the same input, but experience it in totally different ways. So in that way, we could call pain, we can say pain's a psychological experience, all pain. Where people get unstuck is when they start to think about what's going on inside the body. Does pain always have to be associated with tissue damage or potential tissue damage? Because I've just given you two examples of potential tissue damage. One is keeping your eyes open for a while. Yeah. And the other is don't move. Yeah. If you sit for long, and we've got people who are, have spinal cord injuries. We have to teach them to move their body every 20 minutes so they don't get pressure areas because right. they can't feel that they that mechano, mechanical input. Mm. And we have to do that. So it's a protective thing. Then we've got the ongoing chronic pain sort of stuff and that is a different it's a weird entity bunch of entities Mm. but we know we've got this normal acute quickly settling hopefully pain that generally um, fades pretty quickly depending on how much tissue damage is going on and we've got and in that we've got um, activity in chemoreceptors so think of chilies chili peppers or onion, gets into your mucosa, you cry. Mm. Um, ice or thermal thermal receptors, so these are going to tell you the difference between hot and cold, and we've got certain ranges of temperatures that we just don't like. So just try holding onto an ice cube for a while. Mm. See how you can do it. Mm. Or onto a, um, a, to- a hot cup. I have, with my fibromyalgia, hot is I'm much more sensitive to hot, so I can't drink normal coffee. But we'll talk talk about right. that. So we've got our mechanical receptors, we've got our chemical receptors, and we've got our thermal receptors. And so just activity in those, once it reaches our consciousness, and most of the time it doesn't, that is one part of pain. That's one sort of form of pain. I call that nociceptive pain. Then you've got tissue damage, so you've actually done something stupid. Like a 16-year-old boy, I had I had one who, yeah, rides motorbikes. I mean, he's 30 now, and you'd think he'd be sensible, but he's not. Um, jumps, <laughs> over, jumps over fences, does um, unarmed combat in the army, breaks things, wrenches things. Um, that's where you've actually done some damage, and you start to get inflammation going on. And that's your body's really cool response to get the – yucky stuff, any damaged tissue, any infection, anything nasty, get that swished away. Increase the heat in that area because you've got more blood flow going in there. It's quite red, so you know that you hurt yourself. And it swells, so you can't move. And the kind of the function of that is actually to get rid of all of these nasty waste products. But in doing that, we get less, and we need less information to make the, the adjacent nerves fire. Mm. So that's why when you sprain your ankle, you think twice before you go off for another run. Right. You are sensible. If you are not, you decide, bugger it, I'll go for a run and you pay for it later. And I'm not talking <laughs> to you about that ever again. <laughs> <Open up. laughs> Don't be a dick. It's a good thing. So inflammation is the second type of pain kind of mechanism that we think about. And it's really, really common. Normally you don't clinically as a clinician, I don't see people with nociceptive pain. I see people with inflammatory pain. Right. And I see people with neuropathic pain. And in neuropathic pain, we've got a damage that we can identify somewhere in our, we call it the somatosensory system. So it's in a nerve. It's in the spinal cord, maybe. It's in somewhere in the brain where um, there's damage. And we can identify it. We might be able to scan it. So if you've had a stroke, you can scan to right, find Right, okay, I'm with you. Stuff. If you've had a spinal cord injury, we know that below the level of that lesion, we won't have any activity in those sensory neurons. 
in those tracts. And then we've got um, peripheral nerves, so wrists and ankles and um, even spinal cord, the, where the nerves emerge from the spinal cord, um, that those get active. And the most common version of that is probably what we'd call sciatica, where you've got kind of something going on that's squishing that part of the nerve and it's shouting at you. And that's, that's got a particular type of characteristic in, its, in how it feels. So we know those are another kind, and they're, they're weird ones. They're difficult to treat because we don't have good treatments, and they hang about because mm-hmm. our bodies aren't that great at responding to them. So that kind of pain doesn't do any good for us. Inflammatory pain probably is quite kind of useful because it says don't be a dick and do that again, and maybe <laughs> we should take it quietly for a while until things settle down. That's kind of useful. Yeah. But this, this neuropathic pain is not so great. And then we've got the really, really weird bunch where we actually can't put a finger on where the problem is, but the theory goes that it's about how our nervous system processes information, sensory information that it's receiving. And that includes things like fibromyalgia mm. um, and things like irritable bowel and um, a lot of the pelvic pain problems, um, migraines, they all fall into that bunch because we can't say, oh, I spotted where you got the problem. Mm. We know there's inflammation going on and we think that it's just about the way your nervous system's mm. processing. Can we talk that's a little bit? Yeah, yeah. That, that's amazing. Can we talk um, a bit more about fibro, fibromyalgia, et cetera, and that, those types of pains? Because uh, I think there is a lot of, from what I hear from, uh, you know, clients or uh, Pilates instructors out there, et cetera, uh, there is a lot of sort of this stigma around it, uh, et cetera. You know, um, are people believing that you have that pain, et cetera, et cetera. Like could we talk about that a bit more and what, because I would say that a lot of our um, listeners, and Raph, I think you would agree, would be working with clients with this type of pain um, and a, a lot of uh, female identifying clients with this type of pain and um, how best to support them and what are some strategies that, that can be used to support and work with that client. Yeah, so it's pretty prevalent. Um, it would be next to low back pain and probably most people will end up having a bout of low back pain. Um, fibromyalgia has got a very high prevalence, mainly women, but that could be skewed a bit because of the way that women seek treatment. So right. women are really sensible. We don't put up with pain. We go and seek some help. Blokes, not so much. Right. And so there's possibly a skew towards more women going and saying, I hurt. But even saying that in studies looking at how women decide to go and ask for some help, they'll usually have had pain in various parts of your body for about four or five years before they actually oh, wow. say to somebody, hold on, this is really weird, I've got this pain. And part of that's because they, I've heard from my, my clients and my own experience that you think, well, I'm going to go and see somebody about my pain, but it's just moved from where it was to another part of my body. Um, and I don't know whether that's new pain, like a temporary pain, or is it a hang right. kind of around? Um, and I feel like a hypochondriac because I'm going to go and see a doctor about this invisible thing that they can't find, they can't image it, they can't put their fingers on it. It's weird. So it's, it's difficult to diagnose if you're looking for some kind of objective measure, something like a biomarker. You know, take a blood test and we can tell if you've got mm. it. But like I said, we don't take blood tests or we don't have a, a magic x-ray machine that will tell somebody that they've got um, migraine. We just believe them. When people say, I feel really awful, I've got these flashy lights going on, I feel like I'm going to throw up all the time, I can't stand the smell of anything and I'm going to lie down and rest because my head feels terrible. We never, ever question that. Somehow, because women present with this, perhaps because it's widespread body pain, so um, and the, the criteria have changed a lot, but basically you have pain that lasts for three months or longer across multiple parts of your body. Um, in my case, I've had neck pain, 
this flare up's been neck pain since January, probably even leave last year. I would have had it under lockdown. It started to happen, um, but I've had widespread body pain since I was about twenty one. Wow. Okay. Uh, and it was low back pain, but I've also got shoulder pain. I've got lateral elbow pain. Um, I've got groin. Stra- it feels like a groin strain pain. It's not really. And there are times when I'm lying down at night and I'm thinking, now, hold on, which part of my body doesn't actually hurt right now? Um, my left earlobe, I would like to tell you, does not experience pain and neither does my belly button. But, you know, you have to look for it. Wow. And so fibromyalgia is really weird. It doesn't respond to treatment very well. So nothing much changes pain. Um, my pain, uh, there's no medication that is effective for me. Some people do find there's some usefulness to taking um, an antidepressant, an old-fashioned antidepressant called nortriptyline or amitriptyline. Some people find that gabapentin, which is another type of drug that was really used for epilepsy, that that is really helpful. I've tried both of them. They made no difference, not a blind bit of difference, which really, really pisses me off. Because my lovely man has ankylosing spondylitis, which is an inflammatory spine problem. Um, and he's on Humira, which is a, a biological anti-inflammatory agent. And it's reversed his disease and he has no pain. Ah, oh, fantastic. Yeah, I know. No. <laughs> no, you yeah. must hurt as well. <laughs> yeah, you need to die like me. <laughs> but, but the, the the problem with fibro is that things that we would normally expect and the things that are recommended are things like doing exercise. And you know what? You know, I see people that do running and they do it for the high. Yeah. I don't get that high. When you've been doing some exercise, you get huffy puffy and you get this kind of, um, you feel like you've got that glow. Not luminous spheres glow, but a glow. Yeah. And then at the end of it, for about half an hour, people are less responsive to being poked by something that would normally cause pain. Um, I don't get that. Instead, what I get and people with fibromyalgia typically get is an enhanced response to that same kind of input. So what this means is that most people when they're doing new exercise will get a bit of a bit of a glow from it they'll feel pretty nice they'll get that nice little bit of an adrenaline high and generally they might get delayed onset muscle soreness for maybe a couple of days Mm -hmm. and then it'll settle down for people with fibromyalgia we get no joy from the exercise we get enhanced pain response and doms for me will last at least two weeks oh wow so it means that i can't change how much I do quickly. So if I plan to do something like go for a a hike somewhere, um, I will need to work up to it. But equally, I'll have to work down from that level of activity as well. Because if I make any big changes to what I do physically, um, my pain just goes nuts. And it doesn't respond to medications because there's no inflammation. So anti-inflammatories do diddly squat. Um, uh, for people with fibromyalgia, the, um, your opioid receptors throughout your body are not very effective, so they don't pick up on opioid. So if you take an opioid medication, it doesn't have very much of an effect. So post surgery, we take we need an extra amount of opioid, and it probably won't give us a, very much of an impact. It won't change pain very much, and it does nothing. <laughs> for my everyday fibro pain. Wow. That's the bad news. The good news is I'm not dying from it. It's not going to kill me. Um, I can live a really perfectly wonderful life with, with it. I've been living with it since I was 21, and I'm not 21 anymore. I'm considerably older. Um, and it is just part of life for me. Um, I make room for it. If I want to do something that's important to me, then I'll either plan for it plan a recovery time or build up to it or I'll suck it up and I'll say actually it was worth it it's quite it can be worth like if you take me on a shopping trip around Melbourne I can walk for miles I'm happy to do that Bronnie 
I'm, I'm sure you would. <laughs> Let's see. I'm so, I'm, I'm so, <laughs> so up for that. Ah, but you know that I can do that because yeah. I enjoy it. It hurts, but it's worth it. And so, I think when we we know that there are lots of people in well in New Zealand, there's one in five New Zealanders who live with pain that goes on and on and doesn't settle down. Um, that's three months or longer. And out of that bunch. A lot of them, probably about half, aren't looking for treatment anymore. Perhaps because they've given up yeah. because it worked. Perhaps because they don't like the side effects. Because there's no doubt that medications for pain um, have really nasty side effects. They're not mm, nice. No. They make you feel foggy. Um, they just can make you feel nauseous. You can gain weight. They're just nasty. And you're not supposed to drink alcohol, which for a gin loving Ronnie is not a good thing. Yeah, yeah, what alcohol? And I like my gin and I like my my beer and wine and you know, alcohol's a good thing. Was yeah, it you and it, Sandy? Who was having the the gin? Was it you and Sandy Hilton? Oh the, yeah, the, we do. And we also have we also have the San Diego Pain Summit event, which is infamous because I drank far too much. In the hot tub. I was, was going to say, this is the hot tub situation. And didn't Adam Meekins get some sort of hectic mono after that hot tub situation? Yeah, I wasn't in the hot tub with him. I want to tell you that. But it wasn't same year. <laughs> he was so sick. <laughs> it was not great. But I was really sick from that event. So I don't drink purple gin in a hot tub. Okay. Purple gin that's not diluted. You- it's not <laughs> So, <laughs> from Jin, I, Raph, we can, uh, we'd really love to ask Bronnie more about ACT. Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, we're, we're uh, run, starting to run out of time a little bit, but I want to, um, I, I want to, I'm really fascinated by what you've said there, Bronnie, about basically you've decoupled the your pain from suffering and disability and so you 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 don't you haven't found any way to reduce your pain well you know you, you can Not there's some kind of strategies that you have around managing it like you said like pacing yourself up to going for a hike or um you know that kind of thing but really it's it's more uh, you've developed this kind of ability to just live with it mm-hmm. and 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 so I wanted to ask you about um, two topics, and I'm not sure if they're the same topic or 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 not. Right. <laughs> but you know, you can take it wherever you want to take it. Which is, you know, one is what is psychological flexibility, mm. um, and 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 what is acceptance and commitment therapy, and 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 how have the, either or both of those things, you know, helped you or enabled you to, to come to the place that you're at and, and how, you know, how can, how can, how could that be, you know, become, be, be something useful or hopeful for, you know, other people living with persistent pain or for, you know, practitioners who are working with those folk? Or people like you guys who are just being human because that's the cool thing about actors, that it is about humans. We, we encounter stuff that gets in the way of what we think we should be able to do um it might be lockdown i had so many people in lockdown in new zealand saying i can't do my exercise and they kind of decompensated and life was sucky and horrible and what we do to help somebody who's in that boat we say hey there are other ways that you can exercise so exercise is a value Doing exercise and exercising is something important to people. So what we were helping people under lockdown, which is normal, well, abnormal, but it's something that so many of us have experienced, we said, hey, we'll be more flexible about what exercise looks like. That, in a nutshell, is how ACT works. And that flexibility to say, hey, there are different ways I could do this important thing in my life is psychological flexibility. It's a bit more complicated than that because when you say to somebody, oh, I think you should go and do some different exercise, um, people will say things like, but that's not that's not proper exercise. You know, if I can't do it this way, then it's not it's not worth doing. It's not real. It's not proper. 
Mm. And so we have to sometimes work with people who get hooked up with the way that there's only one way to do it. You know, our runners, our weightlifters who didn't have the stuff at home to, to use, we had to think about other ways they could do it that appeal to that same kind of underlying value. And we sometimes had to do a bit of a discussion about, well, if you can't do it one way, at least you're getting some of the benefit by doing it this different way. When we were doing that, we were helping them disconnect from that unhealthy thought. So it's about saying, let's identify what matters to you, so your values. Let's look at ways that you can progressively do this keep doing what matters to you, irrespective of life circumstances, which could be I'm getting older and I can't go out um, riding a horse like I used to. That's a normal human experience. And using ACT, we might say, well, what is it about that that you really loved? What is it about horse riding that you loved? How else could you do it? I wonder if we can support you to, to do that. And let's work with those thoughts that pop up to say, well, it's not the same, so it's sucky, I won't do it. Or I'm the kind of person who always does horse riding and we have this idea of who we are. So ACT has got six processes that we all use. One's about actually showing up to what's actually happening here and now. And that's becoming aware of sensory stuff because all the sensory information that we experience, sight, taste, touch, uh, in the present moment. We could call that mindfulness, but I tend to like to demystify it because you can spend time going on um, or you can dip in and out of this becoming aware of what is actually happening in the here and now. Mm. The opposite that we find people with pain often do is they're remembering the last time they did it, whatever this thing was, and it hurt like hell and I'm going to do that again. And they're also predicting or anticipating the future. And they're saying, oh, if I do this, this nasty thing's going to happen to me. Right. So we want them to just be aware of what's happening. We look at their values. We look at their committed action. So what are they going to commit to doing, even if it's just taking you in the direction of what matters? We look at how they think about themselves. So when you're thinking about yourself, are you thinking of yourself as a pain patient? Or are you thinking about yourself as somebody who can be lots of different facets of yourself depending on where you are which is probably a more healthy way you express different parts of who you are but you know we've all got old scripts that we learned when we were kids who was the troublesome one who who was the black sheep of the family who was the shit stirrer who's the social secretary in the family and you will have adopted that i was the um i was the naughty book nerd (laughs) <laughs> how you can do that too but then you were um so yeah that's I, impressive I, actually the yeah. naughty book nerd don't well, you messy selfish and spoiled and and lazy right. and all i wanted to do was stick my nose in a book therefore i was naughty uh, I know. and so i wore that as a label of who i am and how yeah. i function in the world and we all do this when we're growing up we get a label attached to us and so ACT says, actually, yes, you can be that sometimes. And then there's other times when you're not that, you're something else. And all of those parts of who you are are equally viable. What we're trying to find is something that works in this particular setting. Mm. Then we've got um, willingness to do stuff that is tough. So if you're going to think back to our lockdown people who really want to do their exercise, are they willing to change? the way they do something so they get at least some exercise or are they they unwilling to and we think about people with pain who are used to pushing through pushing really really hard and we they're not willing so they're unwilling to slow down mm. and others are the opposite they're unwilling to go into stuff that hurts because it might be dangerous i'm scared mm. oh that willingness part we try and say are you willing to do stuff pretty difficult so that you can do stuff that, that adds meaning to your life. When you say that, it, um, it really strikes a chord with me. I think, you know, what you said, like about people like us who just kind of want to live their lives, it's so relevant. I see myself and others all the time, you know, creating these artificial conditions that I can only be happy if these specific 
you know, conditions are met and then, oh, you know, th- that specific, con- like, you know, a, a, a young kid, oh, I want the red cup. No, you know, yeah. your sister's got the red cup. No, the blue cup. No, no, blue <laughs> cup. <You know? laughs> um, I've seen some of those. But, but as adults, we do that as well. I can only I can only be happy if I do Pilates in this particular way. I can only be happy if I have this certain amount of money. I can only be happy if I look a certain way or if I a certain yeah. Number of people like my post on Instagram, or you know, there, there is, or, or if, the, or if the chicken dinner I cooked, you know, turns out the way it looks in the in on the blog post or, or whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, we we create these artificial rules and then you know measure our happiness or, or, or make them conditions for our our you know happiness. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's a really good book by an Australian guy, Russ Harris who writes called The Happiness Trap. Um, Most of it's available on his website. Um, And that's exactly what he describes. We put our faith in lots of things and and expect that we should be happy all the time. But if you're happy all the time, you're also not really experiencing a full human range of things. And we're going to be disappointed and we're going to be pissed off at stuff and we're, we're going to be jealous. And we're probably going to fall in love and we're going to have all of this range of human emotion. And if we only want one bit of it, we're actually going to end up losing it on the lot. And that makes life really bad, really hard. Um, Because I don't know about you, but I can't stay happy like for very long. It's going to peak and then it's going to fall over. Likewise, I can't be angry for very long. Watch a two-year-old. They will throw a massive great hissy fit. And if you just let them go, they'll eventually subside because they can't stay pissed off forever. <laughs> Seriously. Sunny, that was huge what you just said. Can you repeat it? It was if if I only want it a certain way, well, I, I don't I, yeah, I, I you, lose a lot. Yeah, if you only want to be happy, then you miss out on everything else, which might be joy, it might be peace, it might be sadness at the loss of somebody. Yeah. I thought about this when my um, – my old sheba dog died. She was a lovely old Labrador. And, you know, we could have said, well, I'm, I don't want to feel this sad when she died. She was 15. But if I'd said I don't want to feel this sad, then I would never know what it's like to be loved yeah. or to have loved a dog like that. She was wonderful. Oh, yeah. I'm going to check. Oh, no. I don't know who's getting me in the Probably a year and a half. <laughs> oh. But, you know, she's still, yeah. she's still part of my life. And, that's the one of the joys of ACT is that um, other therapies ask you to pull your thoughts apart and try and correct them and, uh, and change the content. And yeah. ACT says, hey, we're going to have thoughts. We're going to have thoughts that are momentary and fleeting. We're going to have emotions that are momentary and fleeting. Um, and if we try to hang on to any one of them, thoughts or the emotions, we're going to lose control of everything else that we might also feel Mm -hmm. so maybe it's better just to notice that you've got some thoughts and then choose to act according to what matters in life (sighs) that's where I've tried to learn how I mean my pain I've been living with it for a long time once I realized that it wasn't damaging I'm not harming myself even though this bloody hurts Mm. um I then I have to get worried about it I can still not enjoy it, and I'm not. I would never say to somebody, "You need to accept your pain," because I would expect to be slapped. Because nobody wants to be told that mm. it feels like you're giving up. But instead, you're saying, "I'm making some room to do what matters alongside my pain." So my pain kind of accompanies me wherever I go, mm. and to a greater or lesser extent, it can slow me down, or it might not. For me, it's a it's a, a knowledge that it's not harm. It's just a noisy nervous system. I have tinnitus too. That's a noisy ear. Well, mm. noisy nervous system. So it's just part of um, being human mm. for me. It's also a really good barometer for when I'm tired and I've done too much or um, I'm stressed or I'm too busy and I need to slow down. Mm. So I, you can use that experience in lots of different ways. So I'm kind of at peace with the fact that oh, it would be lovely to wake up and have no pain or find that there's a cure. Mm. I would be lining up. But I would be lining up, and this comes from my PhD, 
people were saying, well, I will never stop um, picking up new stuff. But every time I do, I want to make sure it's going to fit inside my life. I don't want to disturb my life just to get a treatment that takes my pain away. So imagine if you, you have a treatment for pain that says you've got to sit down for eight hours a day under a blue light and you're not allowed to move. Now, what what kind of life is that? Mm. And we um, often expect people with pain to swallow pills, to do exercises when they've never moved before, and they hate exercise, and they especially don't want to go to the gym, but they love to dance. By the way, I first did Pilates in 1983 when the Limbs Dance Company was in New Zealand. Oh, they were, they were uh, are in New Zealand. They came to um, where I was studying, and we did dance training using Pilates, and it was wonderful. Oh. Have any fancy machines though? It was all on the floor. It was oh, a, you fantastic. Know, it was I love Matt Pilates. Matt Pilates is a huge oh. love of mine. It's so oh, cool. Wonderful. So, yeah, so that's. We'll I have to get Bronnie in for a class, Raph. <laughs> <laughs> this body is getting a bit aged. But that's hey, the Bronnie, thing. You, there's um, lots of different ways to live with this thing. Yeah. I have um, to do it one way. I'm aware, like, um, we we talk about ACT a little bit in our uh, diploma just in relation, because I know it's got a pretty good evidence base in relation to anxiety and depression. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's right up, it's equally as effective as cognitive behavioural therapy as far as I'm, yeah. I'm aware. Yeah. Um, is there much of an evidence base on it for for people with, with pain? Is, has that been and researched? It's, it's, yes, it has been. Um, in fact, ACT... Across all disorders, um, there are over 600 randomized controlled trials of ACT across all diagnoses, not pain, but every every diagnosis. Inside pain, Lance McCracken and Kevin Vowles in particular have been doing quite a systematic approach to exploring the relevance of psychological flexibility for people with pain, um, ideas of values-based actions, um, willingness, all of the components um, the evidence at the moment is still fairly weak because unlike um, CBT, ACT is very process-oriented. So CBT says follow this this process, um, this algorithm, do this X, Y, and Z in this order, and you'll all come out popping out the same. In ACT, it's much more fluid and flexible. So inside a session with somebody, I might be – focusing on one particular element of the process because that's where the person is at or I might be on a different part depending on where the person is at so all six processes are important and that makes it difficult to examine using your RCT methodology so there's a quite a large call inside um, the ACT community to look at longitudinal studies that are done with intensive measurement so in the program that I take um our participants can take a measure at every session for six weeks and then we follow them up and look at what's happened over time and we watch how each of the different processes influences the outcome at the end. So it's less, um, doesn't lend itself as well to a randomised controlled trial approach. Instead, we're going to use really horrible statistics, really gnarly statistics, to use lots of data within a person and we look at how this person changes over time and then we collect together people um, and, and start to aggregate that, that data but it's about this person acting as their own control if you like and looking at how it influences wow. them. So it's a different methodology and and yet despite that using RCT methodology at has been a, it's not been around for very long. I started doing it probably in about 93, 94 maybe. Um, CBT has been around a very long time. And CBT just, I don't know if we fleshed out, that's our, for, the, for our oh. listeners, that's cognitive behavioural therapy, just in case yeah. we've got some listeners saying, what's CBT? Yeah. So ACT has been, as an, as an emerging therapy, it's a, it's builds on what we learned from CBT. So it hasn't been around as long and it's still got substantial evidence, not just in pain, but across all of these different diagnoses. So I suspect that in time, what we'll see is CBT hasn't really changed in terms of its outcome measure, outcomes for a long time. 
our technology really isn't said that you're getting better at it. It's kind of sitting there. So I think with ACT, it's probably going to grow and we may find there are some parts of ACT that are much more useful for people than other parts. Or we might find that actually you need to use the whole approach. Mm. Where it's been employed in, um, in the UK, it's been used really widely in the UK, probably because Lance and um, Kevin were doing research at Bath um, University and, and at the Bath Pain Management Programme. But it's been used really widely there. Um, it's certainly emerging in New Zealand. I've used it because the blokes that I work with just lows doing thought records. So cognitive behavioural therapy says, let's get that thought, let's dissect that thought, let's write it down and let's work out why it's not right and what you should say instead. And it involves pen and paper and you're supposed to go away and do it in between sessions and they never do. So they sit in the car park furiously writing. <laughs> Whereas they just say, oh, forgot it, didn't do it. Um, with <laughs> ACT, you don't need to do that. <laughs> you don't have to do it. You just look, notice that you're having some thoughts. And then you learn some techniques to be able to distance yourself from those thoughts. So they're not as sticky. They don't have as much. I am so into this. So how do, I mean, I'm just like, these are just so many light bulb moments for me. For those, like, how will someone, how can, how can a Pilates instructor, for instance, learn more about ACT? What's the best way to? First First step would be to go to Russ Harris's website. And I, I value what Russ is doing. He's got, he's amazing. We'll link he, to that in the show notes. Yeah. He has um has an online training course. And he also has a lot of free materials. One of the things about ACT is that it's like an open source thing. So CBT is often you have to be a registered somebody to do it. Right. ACT says, actually, we don't care. This is pro-social. This is about people being really flexible with humans. This is fantastic. And, give it and so there's no licensing there's um lots of people who become trainers Mm -hmm. russ is one of them um you don't have to have a health professional background you don't even give people any diagnostic labels so you don't say you are depressed yeah um you don't do that you just say hey you're a person and you're encountering life shit and how can we help you to what you what you really want to do, what what matters to you, mm. in a way that that's life affirming, um, and so for that reason, it's just a much more, um, it's about humans, not about pathology, and I that resonates so much for me mm, because same. When you think about people with pain, they get told that there's something dysfunctional with them, and then they often get landed with another label. Oh, you're depressed. Mm-hmm. Or you're anxious or mm-hmm. you're hyper vigilant or mm-hmm. you've got health anxiety or something nasty. Well no, most people who've got pain, yeah, you feel demoralized if you don't know what's going on. You get confused, you get fed up and frustrated mm. because people seem to be not giving you a straight answer. And because there's no simple solutions to it. So I think we've generally people with pain are people encountering a really weird situation, dealing with it as best they can sometimes it kicks into a full-blown um, depression or an anxiety disorder, but most of the time it's not. And so let's not give people these horrible, mm. traditionally stigmatising labels. Let's just say you're a person and you're having a shit time of it and can I help you do what matters in your life so you feel like you've got a bit more control and you can have a life. And if we can't take your pain away, let's, have, let's at least help you do what you really want to be able to do. Yeah, and you've written about that um, quite a bit. I know you've been quite vocal, Bronnie, in advocating that maybe you know, taking away people's pain shouldn't be the the main goal of treatment necessarily. It's it's a good goal to try and reduce pain when possible, but at some point, people will find that it's not working. In the the interference that comes from trying to find like that pursuit of happiness, trying to find a way to get rid of your pain can actually get in the way of living your life. So a person's job goes, their relationship goes, they spend an inordinate amount of time sitting in a waiting room in an enormous pile of money mm. trying to find something that fixes them, mm. getting torn, talk, talked at by people given all sorts of pseudo-scientific crap that crystal this and 
energy that and magnets here and God knows what else. And their quality of surgery, surgery, medications that blot out your thinking, they might take your pain away, but you can't stay awake and you can't think straight and you can't drink gin. (laughs) Life is not worth it. But, well, know, a lot of times maybe. I don't even take the pain away. Like I, you know, yeah. people I've I've seen uh, Peter O'Sullivan a few times live um, to walking with clients, and the client walking in saying, oh, "I'm on X amount of milligrams of Lyrica, or I've got a you know morphine drip in my embedded in my spine, or whatever." Yeah. And and Peter saying, "Well, what's your pain level? It's nine out of ten. It's like okay, or well, how well is that working for you then? You know." Yeah. And that's a question that act is about that workability. How well is this helping you do what matters in your life? Mm. And for so many people, pursuing that pain reduction takes them away from, from what really matters. Because what they really want to be is a good dad. They want to be a good partner. They want to be able to work because they want to provide for their family. They want to have some fun. That's life. And so many of these treatments take people away from that. They can't invest time and energy in developing that. And that's, um, I think that's even more sad than the fact that there's a huge number of people who never even get seen for pain. Their pain's minimised, trivialised, and they're told, well, it's in your head and your nuts, or you're just a woman. My daughter was told, and she went to ED with, um, she had period pain, she had a really nasty cyst in her ovary. She was told, there's no cure for being a woman and given paracetamol and turned away. This is atrocious. This was about two weeks after my partner, who gets kidney stones quite regularly, he'd been into ED. They immediately put him onto a, a morphine pump and said, you know, we'll admit you and we'll deal with this. So there are enormous divides between what women are offered for women's pain Um where it's normalised, you're expected to be able to just mm. deal with um, and trivialised, it's not a problem because everybody, all women have to deal with this. Mm. You, you know, put on your big girl panties. Mm. Um, and then men. And it's it's an implicit difference. It's not something that, that clinicians are aware of. We don't realise that we're doing it. And that is scary. Um, because it means that there are systemic ways that this is being maintained. So we've got to do some seriously hard thinking about our own attitudes as people towards having pain. It's Remember, it's only since ether that people have been able to have a pain relief for surgery. And it's only since coding. Do you remember when coding was first developed? No. 1800s, 1880s. Paracetamol, same. Gosh, same things time. were pretty darn painful before mm. then, So we didn't have anything. My, so, my, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. My, uh, I'm just thinking about that. My um, great grandfather, my nan used to always tell the story. He uh, died uh, a horrible, drawn out death uh, due to bl- what was essentially blood poisoning the Ooh. year before penicillin came out. The mm-hmm. year before. So what he had would have got quickly fixed with penicillin. Instead, he, you know, lived out this kind of like, I don't know, it was six months or whatnot of a, yeah. a horrible pain uh, due to something. So, and I mean, that, gosh, that was, you know, not that long ago. And, and even our attitudes towards pain relief and childbirth have mm. done 360. So they've done a 180 actually and then a 360. So we started off saying you can't have any pain relief for childbirth because it's really wicked. In fact, the Bible says you shall suffer. So suffer you shall. In fact, there was a a physician in the 1600s who who was killed because he offered a woman some kind of pain relief. I think it was alcohol during labor because women are expected to suffer. Then we came into the, oh, it was Queen Vic who said, I'm going to use some marijuana, actually, and then I'm going to have some ether. I'll have ether. And so she was able to change the way that the community said, hey, yeah, if the queen can have some pain Uh relief, so can I. Then we came into Lamar's twilight sleep, which is um, women were sedated, basically. Didn't feel pain because they were sedated. 
mm. and couldn't experience anything actually. And it increased the intubation rates and the lots of instrumentation for the birthing. And then we came into natural birthing. Um, and everybody is now expected to have an epidural or you can have natural birthing, but natural birthing is by far and away the better thing. Isn't it funny? Really? We don't have like natural dentistry or <laughs> you know. natural tooth extraction. <laughs> I'll just hold you on the chair and like. <laughs> so, so normal, healthy human process. And I can understand why people think that you can birth without pain relief. My second baby was born really quickly and I didn't need pain relief. My first, on the other hand, was not. It was lengthy labour and hard work and you know, lots of pain relief. But that just demonstrates to me how our attitudes towards pain shift with the wind, depending on what we as a community decide is okay or not okay. At the moment, we think that it's not okay to have pain and to live well. In fact, we think that's really weird. We think that we should not have pain, we should do all we can to get rid of it. And even if that means that's compromising somebody's quality of life, their ability to relate to their partner, their ability to think straight, because we're going to lumber them up with all sorts of drugs, or put them through painful surgeries, because we think that it's not okay. Um, as well as in our treatments, then we make people do stuff that is not their natural thing. We sit with some people think that there is only one way to exercise, and it's in the gym with weights. Well, I'd like to say. If you come and do a belly dance session with me, a good hour and a half shimmy practice will get you going. <laughs> exercise. Gardening's exercise. So is doing the housework. These are normal human stuff that we can use as a therapeutic tool for helping people do what matters in their life and they'll feel better for it. So, you know, perhaps we over um, overcomplicate the problem, perhaps we over-prioritise pain intensity when I think it's more about can I do what I'm, I want and need to be able to do and am I not very distressed? So I've got clinical questions that I give everybody who comes to my um, my courses. We ask, first of all, why is this person presenting in this way at this time and what is maintaining your predicament? Because most people have pain for a wee while before they actually seek some help for it. Think about back pain in particular. A couple of weeks before somebody even bothers to come and see see somebody for help. It's usually when it starts to get in the way of something important or it starts to not fit the normal pattern. So people get a bit scared. So I ask that first question. And then the second question is, what can we do to reduce distress and disability? Sometimes we do that by offering some pain relief because that might reduce distress. But it might not reduce disability if that person still really freaked out about doing a movement. Because if you think that this pain relief is masking the damage that I've done mm. to back, mm. that person's not going to move. And that's why we have moved in pain management to start engaging people in more active things like movement-based therapies of any kind because we know that unless we treat the avoidance part, the disability part, we're probably not going to change very much because you can still be freaked out about moving even if you've got no pain. And if you don't believe me, think about people who've had angina. They're not having an angina episode right now. They've got chest pain. They're not having it right now, but, but they've changed their entire lifestyle because they're scared they're going to have angina or chest pain again. And that's that's the problem. So sometimes these, you know, injection procedures or other techniques that take the pain away are kind of useful. They can give you a window, but if unless that person's helped to mm. see that they can still do stuff and that they're not doing themselves a, a damage, then they're probably not going to take that out into everyday life. And a lot of people don't take exercise-based therapies into daily life anyway because. Mm. We're a nice, safe place. You as a as a therapist or clinician or trainer are standing beside them, making sure they don't get hurt. And then they've got to go outside and tidy up the garage. 
with all those unbalanced, weird shaped objects that my partner has got in his garage. <laughs> we don't know about that either. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it's an unpredictable environment and that's scary. And so we've got to think, this is my whole theme in life, how can we move from what works in a nice, contained, stable area out into everyday life? Mm. I think the same for research. Why is it stuck away in this little tiny place? Let's get it out into everyday life. We need to do that with our, our therapies as well. That's one of the reasons that I really love ACT for that reason, because you, you use it in everyday life. It's really cool. I can't wait to delve. You've got me so um, fired up about ACT now, Bronnie. I'm really looking forward to going onto that website. And uh, I, I love, it's particularly appealing to me that it's, this is something that our Pilates instructors can learn about and can apply. There's no big rules. You must be this or you must be that to be able to learn this and to be able to use it with your clients. Uh, what a what an incredible gift. Uh yeah, yeah. I, I really I found the ACT community are so generous Yeah, giving you stuff. Like if you go onto Russ's site, he's got all these handouts from his books, stuff that he's, you know, he's making money out of, but he's just saying, here, take this, read this. And inside the ACT community, that's what they do. It's just part of the values. Mm. This is about changing our world. Yeah. Um, it's about making human to human interaction, real, authentic, and not um, not getting stuck in sticky ideas that aren't actually helpful. Yeah, or be practical and work. I oh, like it. I, I'm <laughs> loving that. Loving that. Wow, what a fantastic conversation. Okay, really like, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Oh gosh, <laughs> Bronnie, yeah. do not apologize. Uh, this, I would be happy for this to go for 24 hours. There was so much. I, I mean, this is an episode that I will be listening to again. I can't wait until it uh, comes out and I'm absolutely sure this will be something that our listeners will also listen to again and again and uh, be one of those conversations that you just keep that, you know, you've given us so many there's so many things in there to think about and, and ex, you know, expand on and you've, yeah, uh, for me that was just fantastic. Well, I can talk. See, we, we should not get together. This could be. We done. have to get together, Bronnie. Oh, we oh, have to. <laughs> we are one hundred percent getting in together. Melbourne, I'm in Melbourne. Yeah, and I so, love. I love New Melbourne. Zealand. I love right. New Zealand. I haven't been for a very long time, uh, but when I did go, um, a, an ex of mine and I tr- uh, hired a camper van and drove all around the South Island. And it was, oh, my gosh, it's so beautiful. And you drive over a hill and you just look out and there's like, this was spring, and there's (laughs) snow-capped mountains and these like incredible lakes and then there'd be like little lambs, you know, dancing (laughs) around. And I was just like, where am I? This is so beautiful. Well, I'm in Christchurch in South Island and we have just bought a camper van. His name is Clayton. Do you remember? You guys won't remember. You're too young. The, the ad in the 80s for Clayton's was a drink. It was a non-alcoholic drink, right? Nice. <laughs> it was called Clayton's, the drink you're having when you're not having a drink. Ah. And we have a camper van that is the camper van that you're having when you can't fit it around the backs of the house. <laughs> it's pretty big. So it's Clayton's camper van. Oh my gosh, how then, awesome. Yeah, we don't have a camper van. So we're going to take them down to Twi- uh, not Twizel, to Lake um, Pukaki, which is just on the way to, to Mount, um, Mount Cook. And we're also going to go to Lake Tekabo, which is the dark sky. Um, it's a dark sky, oh, what do they call it? Preservation thing. So, the, so you can see the, the stars up there. It's the most amazing place. Wow. Clear most of the time, not usually cloudy, unlike the rest of New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> um, it hasn't the Mount John Observatory up there. So you can actually they'll put your camera on the um on the telescope and they'll take photos of Jupiter and stuff. Oh. It's very awesome. Oh my gosh, it sounds magical. Cool. And there will be gym. <laughs> oh, magical. So, yeah. So you got it when you're allowed out. When we're allowed when, out, yeah. when when we're the bubble allowed. when the bubble opens back up again, and we've got some yeah. sort of I think at the moment we're probably public enemy one hundred and one again. It's like 
<laughs> all oh, borders it's shut it's to us. <laughs> so frustrating for you guys because oh. it's that sneaky virus. It's just so like it just just so, so sneaky. We're just lucky that we've we have is is the um was it splittings or crowded house the tyranny of distance. <laughs> we have this huge sea between us and anywhere else, so we're pretty protected Love and it. very rigorous border system. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I'm, we've, I'm we've thinking it was split ends. Was it six months yeah. in a leaky boat? Yes, it was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember that song. My era. <laughs> I was waiting for one of you to bust out singing it. I know. No. <laughs> this is not. This is tea. Not gin. it's not gin. Okay, okay, fair. We'll leave that until the gin. Wow. <laughs> Wait for the next San Diego Pain Summit, and then you might get me singing. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, I mean. <laughs> I grew oh, up wow. in a religious family where my father sings opera, and um, we had to do a lot of singing in church, and I have this inner disgust. So, but do you oh, have an really? operatic? I feel like you might have some op- sort of operatic voice that will come out. Uh, not at no. all. Okay. I played the piano and the clarinet. Oh, and nice. <laughs> and on the linoleum. Can you, <laughs> can you sing, Raph? You can play. Do you sing? Can't sing. Can't I'd sing. love to be able to sing. Yeah. I can sing, but you just don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point, actually. I can sing, but <laughs> I've been told to stop quite a few times. Um. Yeah. <laughs> wise. That's wise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Bronnie, for um, spending that time with us and so generously sharing your wisdom, which, uh, as I said, you 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 do, and and I see on on the daily. Um, I'm very, very grateful for you, as I'm sure are a lot of um, our community, and I'm excited that those that don't know you within our community now get to get to know how wonderful you are. So I had to jump into my blog and have a look at that, and yes. yeah. Um, yeah, and we'll link to all of that in the show notes and I'll even uh, link to a couple of your research papers, which are, thank you very much, freely available on ResearchGate. Um, so, yeah, they're, to do that they're awesome. Just to make it, well, yeah. like I said, I don't want to have it locked up inside um, journal, journal paywalls because that just, you know, we do the research with money that we're gifted, granted, and then we do all the work for submitting a paper and then we do all the reviewing for the paper and, you know, peer reviewing, and the journals make the money. Mm-hmm. We do all that for free, but the journals make the money. Is so, that why we don't feel guilty for Sci-Hub? <laughs> well, I don't use it very much, um, mainly because I tend not to be able to find the papers I'm looking for. I'm looking mm. for weird ones. Um, we've got a reasonable library, but also I just post post it out on you know, Facebook and people just throw papers at me. It's wonderful. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> Communities for. I like exploring because we do share. You can share stuff, and we've learned a lot through that through that group. For all its um, occasional fightiness. Oh yeah, it can get That's a bit. It can get spicy, can't it? But it, I tell you what, it's a fantastic, and we'll we'll link to that. Because that's something that, you know, all of our listeners that are listening right now and you, they're going, wait, what Facebook group is this? Can I join? Absolutely, you can join. And uh, if you are interested in the conversations we've we've had today, which I know our listeners will be, uh, this is a great Facebook page to, to join. And, and, you know, you don't have to take part in the in the convos if you don't want you can learn and for the most to be honest for the most of the time now these days I don't take part in it I actually just really love to learn from uh not only the research that's being put up there but the way you people like you hold yourself in in those conversations uh that's really where I I learn the most so that's what we I think the way that we we democratize the whole thing of research, that we don't keep it as something that's pre- preserved out here, that we try to um, engage. Because for me, social media has been wonderful. I've managed to travel all sorts of places I would never have gone if I just carried on doing my research. And I'm a really, really slow research paper writer. It takes me, my fingers bleed. Each word comes out through the fingernails. Pulling them out. I'm terrible at it. And, you know, I'd rather, I, I'm quite quick at writing a blog. I can just zap it down because I'm just thinking off the top of my head. But when you write a research paper, it's just like. You're a prolific bro- blogger. You, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've been doing it 
Well, I first did it when I had my brain injury. Um, so I had a concussion in oh, about oh, six months, no, maybe nearly a year into it. My recovery wasn't very fast and I couldn't paraphrase. And I just, the day before I had my, my knock on the head, I enrolled in my PhD. You can't actually write when you can't paraphrase. Wow, so okay. my speech language therapist suggested I just start paraphrasing. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well blog it and start writing on that. So I did. So you'll wow. see that at the beginning, I was blogging every single day and then it's slowly gone down. But um, but it's been around for a long time. There's a lot of stuff on there. I've not seen it. I might I might be embarrassed by some of it. Yeah. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> wow, thank you, Bronnie. Yeah, thanks so much, Pleasure. Bronnie. It's been amazing. Pleasure. Any time, just shout and I'll do my best. 